Hello and welcome to Perlick's presentation on trends in bar and restaurant designs pre and post COVID. This is Corinne Walenda. I'm one of Perlick's regional sales managers and I have a both professional and personal interest in this very topic. Professional obviously because it relates to things that are going on with bars and restaurants. <clears throat> obviously that's a strong suit of Perlix but also personally because I have a degree in public health and took over a year of epidemiology classes. And I don't believe up until recently, I actually used that degree in public health, but it's been very interesting. And so um, what we're going to explore today is some in, uh, an aggregation of information that I've gathered both from uh, architectural publications, interior design, public health, etc. Uh, we're going to look at trends that have happened uh, prior to COVID and how those might be affected going forward. So many of the concepts that we had seen as trends will be the same, but their execution may be different. And that's an important note. I don't know that things like equipment, setup, etc. will change, but what folks do in a restaurant may well change. In doing my research, uh, I came across some pretty interesting publications. Uh, one is certainly anything that comes out of the International Well Building Institute. <clears throat> and I thought this quote from Rose Weiner from an article that she wrote two years ago, uh, Why Beautiful Spaces Make Us Healthier, was especially relevant. The incorporation of beauty and design is integral to creating space that truly enhance human health and wellness. Uh, very interesting thing to think about in today's environment. Uh, in case you're not familiar with the Well Building Institute, um, they have a well building standard. It's not too dissimilar from the LEED standard for buildings, for, for green buildings, but it also incorporates things that impact human health and well-being. And uh, if you have not taken a look at what the Well Building Institute stands for and what they about how they evaluate buildings i would suggest you give it a shot it's very interesting and again i think this is something that we're going to see more in the future so in doing some research to not only for personal development but also to create this presentation i came across a very interesting person named sarah jensen carr she is a professor of urban planning and architecture at Northeastern University in Boston. And Professor Carr is working on a book that chronicles several diseases that crippled the United States and how design of cities and buildings were affected in an effort to mitigate these public health challenges. For example, in the mid 1800s, uh, cholera influence city design with a grid system for wastewater safety. A grid system removes wastewater that could be potentially harmful away from buildings. She's also looking at, for example, the bubonic plague. That's another, <clears throat> that's another disease that was brought about by rats. And so the reason why we've got higher thresholds and even stoops is because of the bubonic plague in an effort to keep rats out of buildings. Very interesting. Uh, Professor Carr had intended to publish this book in 2020. However, with the advent of COVID, she's obviously delayed that and has uh, quite a big update to do uh, relative to how buildings will be designed in a post COVID environment. My suggestion is you definitely take a look at what uh, Professor Carr is doing. She is on many webcasts and podcasts these days talking about these very things and very interesting studies. And she's come up with some very interesting ideas. Definitely worth checking out. In looking at <clears throat> Professor Carr's research, I also came across this, which I did not know, was that Frederick Law Olmsted, who is the landscape designer that designed Central Park and many other places, was in fact a sanitarian during the American Civil War. He even later described 
building beautiful natural spaces as favorable to the health and vigor of men. Very interesting. Um, and this was a thought that the early 20th century contained a lot of respiratory diseases, for TB, for example, that inspired the adoption of more green spaces in places like New York City. And I expect that given what's going on with COVID, we may well see some more uses of open, free, natural spaces in an effort to keep people healthy. Okay, so let's get into some of the trends that Again, as I said before, we're seeing prior to 2020 that I think will still continue, although with a twist. And the first one I have is called Fresh and Clean and Green. Uh, and I mean this literally and figuratively. Um, the Fresh and Clean look, it has, includes a lot of greenery, a lot of open space, a lot of natural light. This picture here is actually from a restaurant here in Chicago where I live. Uh, it's a rooftop bar and it incorporates all of these elements that I mentioned. I also believe that going forward, restaurants are going to be showing off how clean they are. You're going to see things like extra hand sinks. You're going to see wait staff wearing gloves, also washing their own hands probably every 30 minutes at a minimum. You may well see covers for dishes as they're coming to your table touchless plumbing in washrooms and in hand sinks for both staff as well as guests. Anything that can be touchless will be touchless. Um, perhaps advertised super pure ventilation systems. A lot of the research coming out of Asia suggests that it's possible that some of this COVID virus was transmitted through air. And so having a very pure air, uh, HVAC system that is designed to remove viruses and bacteria will be of, of utmost importance to customers. Greenery, natural light, they feel like cleaner spaces. They make the air feel more oxygenated. Um, frankly, as I mentioned before, I am a uh, graduate with a public health degree. And as a consequence of that, I am a little bit of a germaphobe. And so frankly, a lot of this appeals to me, uh, as I said, on a very personal level as well. But fresh and clean and green, definitely here to stay. And we're going to a lot more of that. As a matter of fact, there is a company called HD Scores. And what HD Scores does is they are aggregating a lot of local public health department data when they review restaurants for cleanliness, et cetera. Some municipalities do already have a rating system. For example, New York has an A, B, and C type of system. Um, other cities like like my town here in Chicago, we do not have such a thing. And so what HD scores does is they aggregate all of the um, health department information and they come up with their own score. And this is actually a screenshot from a local restaurant here in Chicago and they got a 94 out of 100, pretty darn good. Now going forward, Yelp is adding HD scores to some of their larger metropolitan areas reviews. So not only can you take a look at what other people said about the restaurant's food, ambience, serve, serving, etc., but you can also take a look at what the aggregated score is in terms of cleanliness. I suspect people will be more interested in this in going forward. Another trend that we've absolutely been seeing in recent years that is probably going to become more important going forward is multiple concepts under one roof. Because profitability is in the forefront of everyone's mind these days, and to be honest with you, there's, as we always say at Perlick, there's more profit poured at the bar than cooked in the kitchen. It's important to have adult beverages as part of your service to ensure that you're gonna have a profitable facility. Uh, so for example, uh, what you're looking at here is some places that are uh, during the day, one type of concept and during the evening, another. For example, on the lower right, uh, love that grind and grape concept. And then in the daytime, it's a coffee shop and in the evening, it's a wine bar. Sounds like my kind of place. The lower left 
is a picture of the Sentinel newspaper, in, which is located in Marfa, Texas. If you're not familiar with Marfa, it is very much a, an artist colony. A lot of creative folks uh, live there or go to Marfa for um, classes and things like that. Should be, it sounds like a really interesting place. Anyway, their newspaper had this beautiful building, but they needed to find a way to perhaps make a little bit more money. So uh, during the day, it's a cocktail, it's, excuse me, it's a coffee bar, but in the evening, it's a cocktail bar. Great place to perhaps go there and have a nice beverage and uh, talk about the local news. Very interesting. I think we're going to see a lot more going forward. Touches of home is absolutely another trend that we will see continuing. The big thing though that I want to show you here in this photo is the image of the blue. Uh, Pantone's color of the year for 2020 is called classic blue. Classic blue is a great color. They, they determined this was going to be the color last year. And I have to admit that I found that very interesting because I had just been to Peru in 2019, I actually went on a wonderful expedition with National Geographic, trip of a lifetime uh, through Cusco, Peru, and hiking through the Andes, ending at Machu Picchu. Why am I telling you about this? Well, when I was in Cusco, uh, this is an, the, an ancient city. It was initially built by the Incas and then later built on top of that by the Spaniards after they conquered the Incas. But I noticed that all of the doors in Cusco are blue, as you can see on the left the here. And so in walking through the city with one of my National Geographic guides, I asked him, what's the deal with the blue doors? And he is someone who, who could trace his lineage in Cusco back to the 1700s, a very fascinating person. Again, if you can ever have the opportunity to take a vacation with National Geographic, I highly recommend it if you're an adventurous sort. Anyway, so what he told me was that uh, in, in ancient times, when a disease would roll through Cusco, the local public health officials would come to each home. And if they determined that the home had, was free of disease and that everyone inside was healthy, they would mark that door with a strip of blue paint. And over the years, that became very much a, a symbol of a healthy home, a strong home where everyone was, was good and stable. And so people just naturally started to paint their doors blue. And it's used throughout Cusco, not just on doors. You see an image here from Palacio del Inca. That's the hotel I stayed at. Um, had this beautiful blue paint everywhere. It is the color of health and strength. And I believe we're gonna see this used even more so going forward in 2020. And if you think too about companies that are involved in perhaps finance or in health, quite often they're using a color that is classic blue or something very similar to it. Anyway, just a little history lesson. I thought you might find that uh, interesting. I found it beyond ironic that this is the color of the year for 2020. Dinner and drinks and an experience is a trend that we've been seeing for quite some time. People don't just want to go out and have maybe a, a drink and have some dinner. They also want to do something fun too, whether it's uh, curling, which is what you see on the left hand side of your screen. That's actually a rooftop bar of a hotel here in Chicago that has curling on the roof in the cooler months. Um, or on the right, that is a place called Flight Club. Um, also here in Chicago, and apologies I say here in Chicago, but it's because I live here and I took a lot of these pictures. Um, things like playing golf, uh, Putt Shack is, is, a, is a new um, mini golf concept that sounds like a whole lot of fun. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing a couple of those here in the United States, Flying Tee, Top Golf, etc. People want to go out and have some fun. Now, how that's actually going to get managed with um, with social distancing, et cetera, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but I have noticed that people are being limited to, to group sizes, whether it's groups of four or six or eight. Um, and perhaps with some movement of, of the equipment around, they can still accomplish that uh, at places like Flight Club here on the, on the right. Uh, by the way, that's a darts bar, lots of fun. And uh, I don't know, perhaps they're gonna encourage people to 
bring their own darts going forward. Not sure, but we're definitely going to continue to see more of that. Uh, and then dinner and drinks and a chef and bartender show. Uh, as everybody knows, the, the display kitchen is something that's been around for a while. I think there's a great way to accomplish that while still maintaining some cleanliness factors and keeping uh, hygiene at a premium for both the staff and the guests. The picture on the right is from a, a restaurant here in Chicago called Pacific Standard Time. It's a wonderful place. If you ever get a chance to visit my city, definitely check out Pacific Standard Time. I really like how they came up with a semi-chef's table here where the table is pushed right up against where the they can look into the kitchen, but there is a glass partition that separates the diners from uh, the cooking area as well. So you can still sit there, interact with the chefs and have a good conversation, but you're still protected from any, uh, you know, anything that's coming in or out of the kitchen. On the left there is an example of a pop-up bar. Uh, we're seeing a lot more pop-up bars all across the North American continent and what guests like to do is sit there and watch their drink being made. I don't know about you, but I really enjoy seeing a great cocktail made in front of me. But with social distancing, we may see more of these uh, in, a, in a mobile type situation. So something else to think about. You're able to keep uh, guests happy and let them get a great beverage, but we can actually do these in smaller variations using some mobile bars. Rooftop bars and patios are gonna be absolutely critical. Recently, I attended a webcast with many Chicago restaurateurs, as well as the Illinois Restaurant Association. And the one thing that they all agreed on was that patios and summertime business are going to be critical for any restaurants to succeed right now. Rooftop bars and patios have been popular for a long time. People like outdoor spaces. And again, as I mentioned in one of the earliest slides, that fresh, clean, and green, that absolutely applies to these outdoor spaces. Uh, and again, as a germaphobe, I have to put in there that makes a, makes a germaphobe very happy. Um, but also, it's very Instagrammable to, have, uh, to be outside uh, on a beautiful day having a smart cocktail. I think we're going to see more use of any inavailable uh, rooftop space, patio space, etc. Also, planters can be a very, very effective way of sectioning off seating. You can accomplish social distancing without making a space feel so cavernous by adding some planters. And quite often, these are on wheels that can get moved around, so you can still space people six feet apart but have some planters in the middle so it doesn't feel so social distancing, I guess. Um, and what's nice is these planters can get moved, uh, very simple to use. And again, having greenery out there does invoke the feeling of cleanliness and oxygenation. As I mentioned before, outdoor spaces are critical to post COVID restaurant openings. This image was actually taken by Benji Berry, who is one of Perlick's reps in Columbia, South Carolina. This is a brand new restaurant called Market on Main. And as you can see, they have all the tables set up outside on their patio at, at social distancing space. One thing I definitely want to point out to you as well is if you look towards the, the right is a pour your own beer station uh, that we set up with a company called Table Tap. It uses RFID technology so that the patron can go up and just either scan their card or maybe they've got a wristband and then they can go ahead and pour their own beer. However, right now, patrons are not allowed to serve their own beer. So they simply walk up, the, uh, there is a bartender there that can scan their RFID card and pour the beer for them. Um, but this whole pour your own beer technology, definitely something going forward. Um, I think that we're going to see more contactless interactions in restaurants, whether it's um, whether it's ordering through RFID, mobile apps, etc., where people won't actually have to physically touch something that maybe has been passed around like a check presenter or something like that. Semi-private dining rooms are absolutely here to stay. <clears throat> All of these images were taken 
far ahead of COVID. But if you think about it, it makes a whole lot of sense. Say you're, you're trying to get together a smaller group of your family in a restaurant, you could easily rent out a semi-private dining space so that, and that you've got uh, your own space there. Again, plenty of distance between everyone and you're sectioned off from the rest of the guests. Uh, I think any future restaurant designs that are being considered now will have some sort of semi-private dining rooms that can either open or close. Possibly using other things like portable bars or mini chef stations as well um, as an added bonus. Something else to think about when you're looking at dining. I think secluded dining, for, for frankly, I think it's, a, it's very romantic. I also think it's something that people are going to gravitate towards in a post-COVID world. Um, barriers between guests are gonna make you feel certainly more private, and I think it's also gonna feel a little more clean. Both of these images were taken from restaurants overseas. The one on the right is from a restaurant in Hong Kong. The one on the left is from Finland, I believe. Um, but look at that, I really enjoy that. These, you have your own little alcove in here, so you're still gonna feel safe and distant, um, but still part of the restaurant in general. And I just love the clever design that was used to accomplish this. Also the idea of using a lot of translucent materials uh, so you can create these secluded spaces but still have a lot of natural light flowing through them. Something else to think about. Uh, is here, here's something else I just found too. Perhaps you already saw this on Instagram where these individual greenhouses, this is from Amsterdam and so along one of the many canals, a restaurant here put these beautiful little greenhouses along the canal. Um, what a lovely way to spend a meal. Um, that looks perfect as far as I'm concerned. But guess what, this is not a new idea. Here in Chicago, City Winery along the Chicago River has had these igloos in place. And you could rent out these igloos. Now this is really designed for when it gets a bit colder here uh, so that you can still sit outside but, you're, but you are um, warm because you're, you're in a small environment here. Um, here's another shot of what that actually looks like. Um, who knows, perhaps something like this, you were gonna see a lot more of these um, as the weather gets a little bit colder too. Again, you're accomplishing your social distancing, you're still outside, lots of natural light. I think it makes a lot of sense and uh, it looks like a lot of fun too. I have not been in one of these yet, but I think I will in the near future. Certainly we're gonna see a lot with temporary social distancing. These are two images from the same restaurant called Plumed Horse in Northern California. Um, on the left is what the restaurant normal, normal setup looks like. And you can see on the right here, they removed uh, about 50% of their tables to accomplish social distancing. Uh, we're definitely gonna see this going forward. This is a beautiful space and um, uh, notice the the uh, nat natural light coming through and the ceiling as well. Uh, these curves and things like that are something I'm seeing in a lot of restaurant design these days as well. And certainly that looks a lot better than this. This is the, but I, I really, <coughs> really do wanna go here someday. <clears throat> this is the uh, outdoor market in Singapore really world renowned for having some of the best food that you can possibly find at, at any, any outdoor market. Um, but you see they've got permanent tables and chairs there so they've had to mark them off so that they do not have people sitting right on top of one another. Uh, but I still wanna go to Singapore one day and, and visit this. So I think carry out and delivery, is it's, it's here to stay without a doubt. Um, many restaurants have proven that they're really adept at this. The problem that I see with most places that that are doing carry out and deliveries, they really haven't planned the space for it. Um, who's managing it? A lot of times it ends up either with the host station, which is something that's generally remarkably small, or it falls to the bartender. Um, and as if you've attended any of my bar design classes, you know that the one thing I'll always say is there is never, ever, ever, ever enough room behind the bar for a bartender to store everything that he or she needs, not only for creating drinks, but also <clears throat> other things like paper menus, um, extra beverages for delivery service. 
where are they going to store the the bags? Where are they going to transition or store the um, the to go bags? Where are, where are the where are the delivery drivers going to stand, et cetera? So planning for that is going to be really critical going forward. Um, also. A lot of restaurants right now are considering being basically a ghost kitchen, meaning only doing carry out and delivery for much of the week and perhaps only being open on Thursday, Friday and Saturday nights. I think that's definitely something we may well see going forward and it's a good model for profitability. Restaurant and side grocery stores is something else that we've been seeing a lot. At Perlick, at one point, Whole Foods was our number five chain account. <clears throat> That's an, an incredible thing. If you think about all of the chain restaurants that are out there, at one point Whole Foods was number five. They've added loads and loads of bars and little mini restaurants inside of their stores. And I think it's terrific. And again, as I mentioned before, I'm a germaphobe. The thing I love about grocery stores is they are usually extremely spotless, very clean. Uh, and I, with everything that's been going on with COVID, a lot of people are seeking spaces that are exceptionally clean where they can always get a high quality meal and grocery stores are definitely on the forefront of that. Recently I attended a conference where we had a gentleman who was a specialist in the retail side of business, not something we usually think about, but he talked about the grocery store of the future, and that is the image on the lower right. Now, I apologize for the lack of quality in that image, but I actually took it with my cell phone because I could not get his slides afterwards. But if you see in the middle there, that red section, that's where the prepared food and seating is in the center of the grocery store. So there's going to be hot food bars there. Perhaps it won't be self-serve. Again, we don't know what's going to happen with all of that. Um, but places to sit, there's going to be a bar there, social areas, etc. And then while you're there, you could you the other departments of the grocery store flank that. Very interesting. The images on the left and the top are from the chef's table at the Brooklyn Fair Market. There is actually a wonderful restaurant inside this grocery store and that's a gorgeous grocery store as you can see and the whole restaurant against a little mini restaurant is basically a chef's table it makes a whole lot of sense here uh, i think we're going to see a lot more of that going forward and again as i mentioned grocery stores of the future things are going to change dramatically plus frankly if you have a couple of glasses of wine, a lot of that organic produce doesn't seem so expensive now, does it? Okay, stadiums. What's going to happen with stadiums? We love going to sporting events and, and cheering our team on. Um, <clears throat> in reviewing what may well happen in a post-COVID world, I, I came across an architect named Dan Meese, and he talked about the concept of optional togetherness. And I believe this was from an Architectural Digest article that I had read. Uh, and this is one of his concepts here, having spaces where you can either be in with the crowd or you can be outside, but still have access to and see what's going on. A very interesting idea. Um, and here's a little bit from the article that I read. Um, he talked about having improved opportunities for hand washing and sanitizing. I mentioned that before. I think that is gonna be here to stay and uh, makes a whole lot of sense, as well as RFID technology to make purchases. I've been to several music festivals where instead of using credit cards and cash, they wanted everyone to have an RFID bracelet. And that was a really easy way to pay for something to drink, something to eat, etc. Again, that's contactless. Absolutely think that's a great idea. Um, plus, it's faster, frankly. Uh, I believe we're going to see a lot more of that going forward. Now, he mentions some, some perhaps some temporary measures of temperature screening um, or disinfection we're using UV, which is a, a high tech but very effective uh, methodology. Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, but you may well see things like clean air showers for for restaurant workers in certain designs, um, particularly if it's in a healthcare facility. Uh, think about that air showers that, that will basically disinfect everything that you're wearing going forward, boot scrubbers, etc. cetera. Um, 
may well be the, the way things are in the future. And, it, and in looking more at what this architect has talked about in the past, I did find in a 2016 presentation that he did at South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas, that he actually predicted the death of what we consider to be the modern stadium and uh, talked about other ways um, to evaluate how to build future stadiums and spectate for sports. Pretty interesting. We'll have to see what happens, I guess. I do think we're going to see more use of antimicrobial finishes and products. What the healthcare industry, and that would be hospitals, assisted living facilities, et cetera, have been doing for years, are now going to be adopted by restaurants, hotels, et cetera. There are many products, finishes, materials that are naturally or can be coated with an antimicrobial finish. Uh, there's companies like, uh, these, and this is a brand name, Rich Light, Lapitec, uh, Microban is also a brand name that have products that they specifically design for the healthcare industry, um, but that's going to be applied to many different kinds of applications. Silver compounds and low friction surfaces are something that are already being used in healthcare, particularly in surgical suites because of their antimicrobial properties. Low friction surfaces are especially important for things like POS stations or anything that have frequent touches. Uh, that if something that's low friction, what that means is that bacteria, viruses just simply cannot stick to it anymore. So look for all of these to be incorporated into the designs of products, furniture, et cetera, going forward. Okay, I work for Perlix, so what am I going to talk about with, of course, I'm going to talk about the bar. Um, will the layout of the bar change? Maybe. Uh, it's very expensive to change the layout of the bar, but for the, but tasks for the bartenders and the bar backs will probably change temporarily, if not permanently. So the way that we design bars are from left to right, clean, to dirty. Bartenders frequently have the same job. They have one job where they are doing both the creation of the cocktail and they're also cleaning up afterwards. That function may well get split where the bartenders are only going to be creating cocktails and they'll have another restaurant employee, likely the person who's maybe been the bar back or, or someone else who will only be responsible for the, the quote unquote dirty tasks, meaning the cleanup tasks. They'll be the ones that are managing dumping the ice, uh, getting um, all of the glassware, plates, etc., into a bus tub and getting it out of the bar region. I think we're going to see clean and, and quote unquote dirty areas of the bars more delineated. Um, you see I used blue to represent the clean and red to represent the dirty here in this lineup. Um, we may well see that change slightly. Who knows, there may just end up being a return there so that it, these two people can work together more effectively. But that's a very classic design of a bar layout. And um, again, uh, it could mean just that the equipment's gonna stay the same, but the functionality of the people who are working there will change. So here's some resources that uh, I use to create this presentation. There's many more out there. Uh, feel free to take a screenshot of this and follow up with any of these folks here. Again, uh, that Sarah Jensen Carr is the one who's writing the book, The Topography of Wellness. Very, very interesting. I think you would enjoy it. And thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And should you have any questions, feel free to give me an email. Um, I'd love to hear from you and have a great day. Take care.